and welcome to the lecture on chapter 28. We're going to continue talking about light, and this time we're going to talk about something called ray optics, and specifically reflection and refraction. So this is treating light as if it's traveling along straight paths and considering what it does geometrically. Okay, so to discuss these topics, we're going to talk about reflection, the principle of least time, which helps us understand why light takes the path that it takes, the law of reflection, a simple one, then refraction, which is the bending of light, the causes of refraction, which is a change in the speed of the light in other media than a vacuum, dispersion, which is you know, basically refraction that, that is a function of wavelength, then how that results in some in rainbows, total internal reflection, just one special case, lenses, and finally lens defects. Okay, so let's get to it. So what is reflection? Well, we say light is reflected when it is returned into the medium from, where, when she, from whence it came. The process is reflection. When light illuminates a material, electrons in the atoms of the material move more energetically in response to the oscillating electric field of the illuminating light, and the energized electrons re-emit the light by which you, see the, by which you um, then see the material. Then you like a mirror, for example. It's reflecting all wavelengths of light. Some, mater some materials can only reflect certain wavelengths. Other materials, namely those with lots of free electrons, can, can reflect just about every visible light wavelength. Okay? So that's, that's the idea of a reflection. It's basically absorbing energy into an atom or into the, the state of an electron that causes a oscillation, which essentially is like, you know, like an, a pendulum swinging back and forth or a spring bouncing back, back and forth. But in this time, it's the scale of an electron. So different but similar idea. And then eventually that energy is re-emitted. So essentially the oscillating energy of the particle or the electron is then turned back into electromagnetic radiation. And that's what you see as reflected light. All right. So that's reflection at the atomic level. And we kind of keep coming back to that, don't we? We keep coming back to saying, oh, okay, to understand light, you have to understand how it interacts with atoms. We did that for transmission as well. And so that's definitely a key idea that we keep coming back to. Eventually, we'll kind of formally introduce the, the direct relationship between energy of a photon and electron energy states. But for now, it's a bit of a fuzzy idea. So you know, keep that in the back of your mind. But now another separate concept, and that's the principle of least time. This isn't so important for reflection, but it's very important for understanding refraction, the bending of light, which we'll talk about as the majority of this chapter. So what is it? Well, the principle of least time says that, the, that light takes the quickest path in going what, from one place to another. All right, it's Fermat's principle of least time. Now I know it's giving some sort of like free will to the light that is always choosing the least path. That's not actually the case, but it is a helpful way of, of thinking about what light does. That's why it's called a principle because it's just, it's just a helpful rule for us. Okay, so that means if we're gonna find the shortest time for light to go from A to B by reflecting off the mirror, then the angle has to be the same for, reflect, for incidence and reflection. So um, and then we, can, we construct on the opposite side of the mirror an artificial point, which is the same distance through and below as the point B above the mirror. All right, so this is our imaginary or artificial point. And the shortest distance between A and this artificial point is a straight line. The straight line intersects the mirror at point C, and the precise point of reflection for least time is from A to B. Okay, so I said the principle of least time is most important for refraction, and I think it, it, it is, but it does tell us that these two angles have to be the same, and it's a good justification for what's called the law of reflection, because it tells us that the angle of incidence, we'll call that theta i, has to equal the, the, the angle of reflection, okay? And normal, by the way, is an imaginary line that we draw straight above the surface. It's perpendicular to the surface, all right? And so then the law of reflection looks like this. It says the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. So this angle here, theta i, equals theta reflection, okay? They are the same angle, right? So if this one's 20 degrees, then the other also must be 20 degrees. They're never going to vary. That's true. That is true of reflection off of surfaces, okay? Now, you might say, okay, well, what, what about, you know, the idea then of, of light that's bouncing off at many angles. Well, that's due to imperfections in the surface. If, it, if this applies to any perfectly smooth surface, now, now if it wasn't a perfectly smooth surface and we have lots of normal lines, the law of reflection would still apply, but the macroscopic effect would be light bouncing off in many, many directions. This is the idea behind why we can like shine light on a wall and the wall kind of gets overall illuminated, like the wall gets lighter. That's because it's bouncing light off in many directions due to the, the rough surface of the wall. 
mirrors are, are tried to manu be manufactured very smooth so you get a nice clear image so that all the angles are the same because there's only one normal direction, okay? So the law of reflection applies to what? All right, so we said, you know, it applies to, you know, definitely light, we we're just talking about it, but do you think it would also apply to sound? It would, because sound is a wave and it, it, it follows the same principles, all right? So the angle of incidence for a sound wave re reflecting off of some surface is then gonna be the same as the angle of reflection, just like it is for light, all right? And, all, and again, the law of reflection is very, is very straightforward. It just says that the two angles are equal to each other. Theta I equals theta F. Okay? All right. So, an interesting consequence of the law of reflection is some of the terminology you get for discussing images. Now, an image is an interesting thing because an image applies to what you see in a mirror, and it also applies to what is created with a lens. So that same terminology of image is used for both discussing lenses, like a lens in a camera or in a pair of like reading glasses, and for mirrors, okay? Both flat mirrors and curved mirrors, all right? Think funhouse mirrors for curved mirrors, okay? Or for, you know, also you'd see them in a laboratory. Okay, so there's a term here called the virtual image. What is the virtual image? Well, the virtual image, in the case of a flat mirror, is the same size as the object. It is formed behind the mirror and is located in a position where the extended reflected rays converge. It is as far behind the mirror as the object is in front of the mirror. Okay, and that's for flat mirrors. For flat mirrors. Okay, notice what we're doing with the rays here. This is the first time we've really seen a proper ray diagram. So we draw rays and we just follow the law of reflection, right? So I just know that there's an angle here, theta. There's another angle here, theta. Those two angles have to be equal to each other. That means I can then continue an imaginary or virtual ray that is an extension of the reflected ray back into the mirror, and that will tell me the location of that part of the object, okay? And then I could do it for another ray that goes straight in. In this case, because the angle here is zero with the normal vector, so the angle between this ray and the normal vector is zero degrees, that means that the reflected ray is actually parallel to the incident ray. Notice that's the only time that that happens. Only when rays are exactly in the normal direction is the reflected ray actually, um, well, anti-parallel to the incident ray because they're on a straight line in that case. There's, it's zero degrees equals zero degrees, right? And so then our projected imaginary ray or virtual ray would then just go into the mirror like this. And we can do this any number of rays. You can see we, we do two other rays, all of them following the law of reflection, okay? Now, and then we can so call this theta one, theta one, theta two, theta two, because they're, they're different angles. Just both, in both cases, there's a pair that are equal. And that way we can find the exact location, just finding where all those dotted lines, those virtual rays can converge. Virtual rays, okay? So very, very kind of interesting way of thinking about exactly where the image is gonna be formed. Now, we also have simple rules for thinking about where the image is formed for a flat mirror like this, but for curved mirrors, it's more complicated. So it's good to get used to the idea of what, what is meant by ray drawing. Okay, so a plane mirror. All right, so note the only axis reversed in an image is the front back axis, okay? So in other words, you're not, you know, how it always seems like things are, you know, backwards, the left to right. That's not true. That's, that's the way our mind interprets it, okay? That's, okay, I, I want to stress that. That is, that is the way that the, the front back reflection gets interpreted by our mind because we're not going to interpret it as us being flipped upside down Instead, we, get, we interpret it as because we have a very strong understanding of up, up and down in terms of our kind of neural processing. But the actual axis that is reflected, that is reversed, is only this front back axis. The left right axis is not actually reversed. It's just the perspective or the processing of our brains that make it look that way. Okay? All right. So now the other types of mirrors, convex and concave. All right? So convex curves outwards. All right, concave, like a cave, goes inwards. So you gotta, that's how you remember the terms, all right? Convex is out, concave is caved in, all right? And in the case of those two mirrors, that depends where you put the image red, uh, relative to something called the focal point, but in general, for a convex mirror, you're going to have a virtual image that is smaller than the real object, and for a concave, concave um, excuse me, for a concave mirror, you have a image that is larger than the object, okay? All right, and in this, in this case, there, it would be a virtual image in both cases. We know it's a virtual image because it's being formed behind the mirror, 
Now, there's also real images that are informed, formed in front of the mirror, but we can't see them, okay? We cannot see real images. We'll, just, we'll talk about them. Now, real images are great. They're, they're useful for, say, you know, developing photo, you know, photographic paper or something, for actually projecting an image onto a screen, but the eye can't perceive for, um, real images because that means that the light is converging at a point. We don't want the light to converge at a point. We want our, the lens of our human eye to actually converge the light. So we, we need a virtual image. We need the rays to be coming from multiple sources, not to have already converged. And virtual images are that source, thus they are perceivable to the human eye. Okay? All right. But again, in summary, convex mirrors, smaller, concave, larger. And we can confirm that by simply following some example rays and following the rule or the law of reflection. Okay? And then we just project that ray back, that virtual ray back into the mirror, and that shows us that in this case, the tip of the hat is actually higher in the case of the concave mirror, and it's lower in the case of the convex mirror. And how do we know that? Well, because the normal lines are different, right? The normal line here kind of curves slightly upwards. The normal lines here curve slightly downwards, see? And that's, that's, that makes all the difference. And in each case, the normal line is perpendicular to the surface. So I'll zoom in here and really show you, right? So if I draw a normal line, right, the idea is it has to make right angles. It means it has to curve slightly down. If I, draw, if I draw a normal line right at the part of the mirror where it's um, you know, uh, vertical, well, in that case, there would be one example of a normal line that is horizontal. But then as I start to go down, the mirror starts to curve back out to the, uh, to the left. Now all the lines are going to start being curved upwards again. Okay? Does that make them a little bit more dramatic than they really are? But you get the idea. Okay? Those are all normal lines. Normal direction. Normal, and normal is just, is just a term that means perpendicular. All right, so light reflecting from a smooth surface undergoes a change in what? All right, nothing. There's no change in the light. There's no change in its frequency. There's no change in its velocity, and there's no change in its wavelength. Okay, all the reflect the reflection because there's no there's you're not, you're not traveling from one medium to another. And if you're reflecting off a mirror, then you go you go from air. You know, you get bounced off the mirror because the electron basically oscillates, then returns the energy. And so that where does the energy go? Right back into the air. So in that case, air being nearly a vacuum, the speed would be the speed of light in both cases. It's the same color light that's being reflected, so there is no change in frequency or wavelength and certainly not in velocity. Okay. Diffuse reflection, I mentioned this. This is when there are many different normal directions, like a wall. And so this, this you, you don't get a clear image off of something like this, but it's good for illuminating a room. So you imagine if you, if you were in a room that was all mirrors, and you had a light source in that room, you basically just see that, you know, it'd be, the room would be not very well lit because there'd just be, you know, that light source bouncing off all the mirrors and there'd just be, you know, kind of multiple, reflect, multiple reflections of that light source. But instead, if you're in a normal room that just has white walls or, you know, some light colored wall, well, then you're going to get that overall illumination from a single light source. And that's because of diffuse reflection. Okay? All right. Um, as far as diffuse reflection, it applies, um, there's a good example of it in terms of road surfaces. Um, so rough road surfaces, because of the diff diffuse re reflection, you see the road um, ahead at night. But if it's wet, then it's smoother, then it's actually harder to see the road, all right? So if you have like a, like a wet, rainy night, or maybe you have a night where it just rained and the road is really, it has like a layer of water on top of it, then it's actually harder to see the road, okay? And maybe you've noticed this, right? It's, it, it is noticeably harder to see the road because essentially your headlights are all bouncing off of one point. And you see, so you're kind of seeing that, that single point of reflection, but you're not seeing a large region that's being illuminated, right? So it's a much smaller region because of that smoothness due to the water on the road, okay? So diffuse reflection occurs when the size of the surface irregularities are, I think, small compared to the wavelength, large compared to the wavelength, what do you think? All right, large compared with the wavelength of the reflected radiation, okay? So because if they're, if they're smaller than the wavelength, then, in, you know, then the, the, the difference isn't going to show up in terms of it's, it's effectively smooth in that case. So you don't need something to be infinitely smooth. You just need something to be smoother than the wavelength of the light. So in the case of visible light, that wavelength is hundreds of nanometers. So you need, the, you need basically the imperfections on a, on a smooth surface to be, say, tens of nanometers, and then it would be imperceptible. Okay? And really what you couldn't, you couldn't perceive it within those wavelengths. All right, so now on to the bending of light called refraction. So, so far we got reflection, which is the bouncing of light, and we already talked about transmission, okay? Now we're talking about refraction. What is refraction? Well, refraction is a change in speed of light because light is traveling through something other than a medium. Okay, when we talked about transmission before, like transmission through a um, through glass, and we talked about how it was specific on certain wavelengths, and glass was opaque to both ultraviolet and infrared, you know, and that was important for considering color, 
right? Um, but here's the thing. What we didn't highlight that we're going to highlight now is that one thing that's always true of transmission, no matter what, what wavelengths are being transmitted and which ones are not, there's always a change in speed because transmission requires, especially transmission through a solid, requires the atoms of that solid to absorb and re-emit the light. That process takes time, thus effectively slowing down the speed of light. Not because light has truly changed speed, but because the effective rate of the light transmitting through the material has changed. Okay? Now, that's because if there's that, that, that delay, each atom has to absorb the energy, the electron gets excited, the electron relaxes, re-emits a photon all right, of equal wavelength and frequency. Um, and then so that, that, that process continues. And actually, it is the, what happens because the, what actually does happen is the, wave, the wavelength will change. Okay? The wavelength of the light will change because, to compensate for the change in speed. The actual um, what won't change is the frequency. The frequency is unchanged during refraction, but the wavelength is changed. All right, the wavelength is always changed during refraction, okay? Because the speed has to change, and the idea is that velocity equals wavelength times frequency. Frequency is unchanged during refraction. Unchanged during refraction, okay? So when I said that the, uh, the atom re-emits a photon of equal wavelength and frequency, it's not equal wavelength, okay? It's actually equal frequency. The way, the, the, but the process of that delay means that the overall effect is a different wavelength. All right. So when light bends in going obliquely, obliquely just means not straight on, from one medium to another, we call this process refraction, all right? And the, the real consequence of it, you know, besides the kind of the, the atomic level explanation that I was discussing, the real kind of macroscopic consequence are these angles, the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, okay? Because these angles are not equal to each other, all right? If the medium changes, then the angles are not equal to each other. For example, going from air to water means that the angle will change. In fact, it will always, the angle will always decrease if you go from air to anything else that is not a pure vacuum because air is, um, is very close to a vacuum. And when you go, you know, especially compared to things like water. And so then you go from air to water, the angle will always decrease. Okay. Why is that? Well, it goes, it goes back to Fermat's principle of least time. Okay. That's a good way of understanding it at least. Because what happens is when the light travels into the material where it moves more slowly. Okay. Because in water, the light is moving more slowly. It has a, a, um, it has an index of refraction that is greater than 1, okay? So n is greater than 1. n is the index of refraction. We talked, we talked a bit about how the index of refraction says how quickly light can travel through different medium, right? We talked about the, um, I think it was two chapters ago, we talked about the index of refraction of different materials, including water, which is 1.33, uh, uh, diamonds, which is like 2.44, one of the highest indexes of refraction. And that was, that was just to highlight the idea that, that light has different velocities when it's in anything other than a, um, basically anything other than a vacuum. Well, this is, this is the follow-up to that. This is the consequence. This is the bending that occurs because of that speed change, okay? But it all falls under this explanation of Fermat's principle of least time because let's, con let's consider the light as a lifeguard, okay? A very good lifeguard. Because the lifeguard knows that the quickest path to get to the person that's in, excuse me, wow, sorry about that. The person that's in distress is not to straight, take a straight line, but instead to spend just, amount of, just, the, just the right amount of time on the sand and the water in order, in order to get there quickest. Why is that? Well, because they can move faster on the sand and slower in the water. Okay? Now, there's the thing. They don't move infinitely faster on the sand. Maybe they just move twice as fast. So they don't want to stay on the sand the maximum amount of time, right? Because then they'd be on, then, then they'd, you know, then they'd have a straight path and the minimal amount of, minimal amount of distance in the water, but that, that actually would be over, overdoing it. Because, again, the sand, they're slower, but they're not, you know, infinitely slower. So they don't want to spend maximum distance on the sand. Instead, they want to spend just the right amount of time on the sand and the right amount of time in the water to make this dotted green line the quickest path possible, much quicker than the solid blue line, all right? Does that make sense? Okay, and that's, and also, you know, quicker than the red, the red example line that I drew because that one would be spending too much time on the sand, okay? That might be even slower than the blue one, right? Depending on how much faster they are on the sand. But there's always, there's always a case depending on the relative speeds, right? Again, you know, it could be that they're twice as fast on the sand, maybe they're only one and a half times as fast on the sand, or whatever are the relative speeds between their swimming speed and their sand running speed, then that's, an, that's going to determine, 
That's going to exactly determine what this angle is. And this angle would be the angle of incidence and refraction. This angle right here would be the angle of incidence. And then this angle, which would always be smaller because they're going to be moving slower in the water, is going to be the angle of refraction. Okay? That's the idea. That's the idea of refraction. The path of least time that light will always take. Okay? So light fo follows a less inclined path in the glass. Light travels slower in the glass than in the air, so it minimizes the time it spends in the glass. And this is, this is re re very well highlighted in the idea of, tra of traveling through a pane of glass. Because we can clearly see that if glass continued along the straight line and didn't curve into the glass, then it would obviously be spending longer in the glass. And it doesn't want to do that. Okay? It, want, it wants to spend less time in the glass because it's traveling more slowly in the glass. So that the overall path is basically is reduced. Okay? The overall time to take the path is reduced. And it's, re and it's, mi it's the minimal time now. Okay? And again, the idea is if, you know, it would, it would still be, you know, going, in this case, we're going from A to C, it still wouldn't make sense to go through the, the glass straight through to actually literally take the, the shortest path to the glass because that would not be the, sh the path that required the least time because the, the actual shortest path to the glass would require the light to come like way down like this, okay, take a much longer path in the air and then cut to the glass essentially exactly normal to the, to the surface, to the air glass interface, okay, all right? But that, that, would, that would be a longer path. That would not get us to see any faster, okay? That would, that would, that would actually um, increase the time to go from A to C. So that the minimal time to go to A, A to C is this path right here. This one that I'm just highlighting, okay? That's the one we want, okay? So light rays pass from air into water and water into air. The path rays are reversible for, um, for both reflect, for, for reflection and refraction. Right, so the refractive index n, okay, indicates how much the speed of light differs from its speed in the vacuum. So n exactly is going to equal the um, basically it's going to equal the the speed in um, let's see. So it's n times v equals c. So it's going to be c over v. There we go. So it's c is the speed in the vacuum. And then V is the speed in the material. All right, so it's the ratio of the speed in the vacuum to the speed in the material. That is N, the index of refraction. Formula, the formula that you need to be able to plug in numbers for. Speed in the vacuum is always 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, and so here it is written out as a formula. All right, so mediums with high index means high bending effect and the greatest slowing of the light. And the most dramatic example is really diamonds, which is 2.44, okay? N equals 2.44, okay, for diamonds. For water, it's 1.33, okay? And there's no units on the index of refraction because it is a ratio of velocity, so it is dimensionless or unitless, all right? So refracted light that bends towards the normal is light that has, think about bending towards the normal, minimizing the path. So that's light that has slowed down. You got it. Okay. Refracted light that bends away from the normal. Okay. And that, that's like the light that's leaving glass going back into air. That one is speeding up or that light that has sped up. That's the only time you see it bending away from the normal. Okay. So. This creates that effect of objects appearing at one lo location in a, in a medium, but not actually being at that location. We see that when we look inside a glass of water and we see that, that straw that's bent, okay, like that was in a previous figure. We see it when we like at, our, at an aquarium and we look at fish. They appear to be in one place, but they're actually not there. Um, it's important if you're looking down into a lake and you're, trying, you're like seeing things down, their, act, their, their actual location is not where they appear to be because the light from the source inside the light, that because effectively any object that you can see inside of a body water is a source of light. As that light travels up to your eye, it refracts as it goes into the air, making the object appear somewhere, but then actually be located somewhere else. All right. So case in point, here is the actual location of the fish, but the human observer up here will see the fish right there. All right. 
And so that means that the, the fish is always going to be lower and a little bit further away than where the observer is, especially when the observer is, is obser observing at this angle, right? All right, this also applies to the sun, right? So this could, be, we, this, uh, this could go back to, you know, like when we were talking about why sunsets are red. Well, if you think about an actual red sunset, when the sun appears to just be setting on the horizon, the sun is actually already below the horizon, but the light is, has bent in the atmosphere, so the sun appears to be here, but it's actually already set. So every time you see a sun that is right at the horizon, the actual location of the sun relative to Earth and relative to a, a line where you are on Earth, I should say, so if you were to actually draw a line through space, 150 million miles to 150 million kilometers to the sun, you'd find that the sun is actually below the horizon. And it's just the, it's just the refractive effect of the, of the atmosphere that makes it appear to be above the horizon to you. This, um, and here we have the, how this creates mirages, all right? So we have a source of light being the palm tree. And again, it's not because the light is actually um, you know, emitting light. We know that's not the case, right? The palm tree is just a source of light in the sense that it's, re it, that it's rejecting certain colors, and that's what we're seeing. But still, it is rejecting those colors, so it's behaving as a reflected light source, okay? Just not an emission light source. So it's still a source, okay? Just a reflective source. And so what happens then is because the light bends down, that when you are an observer, you appear, and this, and this really is kind of based on, again, how the brain processes information. When we see something, we assume that we're seeing it in a straight line to where you know, our eyes are looking. So when you, when you see that palm tree and you see the path that the light is coming into the eye, then the eye tells the brain, oh, that palm tree is here, upside down, underground. And so then, you're, then your mind goes on and saying, oh, well, that must be water, right? And so you look at that, that effect of the, the, you know, the atmospheric refraction, and it appears like the palm tree is being reflected in water, thus the mirage implies that there must be water, when in fact it's just hot sand. And the reason that's hot sand is because this bending is due to the much hotter air right near the surface of the sand, where the air temperature is very, very high. And that high, that high, temperature, that high temperature air has a different index of refraction of the cooler, the cooler air temperature that is a couple meters above the ground, okay? So when light travels from one medium to another and changes speed in doing so, we call that process, if you've been paying attention, you know the answer, that is refraction. That is what refraction is, okay? So um, the bending, uh, we can think of the causes of refraction uh, as the bending of light when it passes from one medium to another caused by a change of speed in the light. And that changes what? It changes the wavelength. See that? Remember how I mentioned before that it's the wavelength that changes? So there's the initial wavelength, which we could call lambda naught for initial, and then there's the actual wavelength in the material. These two are not equal to each other. There's always a change in wavelength any time there is bending of light due to a change in speed. But remember, what doesn't change is the frequency. The frequency remains the same. It, because the, you know, because only, only, one, only one thing has to change when the speed changes. When the speed changes, one of the two things have to change, either, either the wavelength or the frequency, and it's the wavelength that changes. That actually makes sense in terms of conservation of energy because the oscillation is still happening. The actual up, the up and down, the electromagnetic field, that, that is still oscillating at the same rate. But the actual distance between peaks, that has changed, thus slowing down the wave, okay? So dispersion is quite common, and that's because, you know, we've been talking about refraction and, you know, how light travels at different rates, and I say, oh, you know, they, you know N equals 2.44 for diamonds, okay, right? And maybe N equals 1.5 for glass, okay? But that's a simplification, because it turns out that many materials, like quartz glass, for example, has, an, you know, an N of 1.5 for red light, but then it ha might have an N of 1.49 for blue light. So there's slight variations in the index of refraction for different wavelengths. And that means that different colors bend different amounts, which means they get separated, okay? And glass does this quite well, especially to certain types of glass, and that's how we get dispersion. Because the red light, in this case, didn't bend as much as the blue light. The blue light bent more, and thus the two colors get separated, and that's how you can create a rainbow with a prism because of selective refraction, because of refraction that is a function of wavelength, okay? All right, so when, um, when white light passes through a prism, green light is bent more than red light, okay? Red light is bent the least, blue is the most, okay? So raindrops are a result of dispersion by many drops, okay? Because the dispersion doesn't just occur in glass, it also occurs in water. They angle smaller in water, okay? But it is noticeable, and we see it with, with the rainbows, right? And so we see a particular 
um, basically an, uh, a, a difference of two degrees between the one extreme of the rainbow and the other. Okay, so and there is and there's often like a second step too. We'll talk about that. But what happens with the rainbow is the light comes in, it then it travels into our assumed spherical droplet of water. It is um, it is then reflected off of the back. Okay, you might be like, wait, shouldn't it just pass into the air? That's true. Some of it does pass into the air, but some of it is reflected due to something called total internal reflection because there's a certain angle where reflection will occur. Okay, and that's reflection that's driven by refraction. I'll, I'll mention that just in just like the in just a couple slides. Okay, but the, regardless, then well, that causes the 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 light to come back out of the drop, and then so then as it then re-enters the air, you have that that secondary effect of the of um, of different bending angles, and the light is separated, creating a rainbow. Okay, and so here's here's examples of that happening for many many water droplets, and then the overall effect is the rainbow. Okay, because it's not just one droplet. Okay, and so here we are, right? We're seeing kind of that, that whole band of light creating, you know, that basically that arced path and really, really showing what's going on here in terms of imagining lots and lots of little individual water droplets and that, comp that composite effect being the rain rainbow, the arc of light. All right, all right, this gets more into the details. I'll leave that up to you. So, um, Secondary rainbows are fainter, and that's due to, to the light that actually doesn't um, reflect off the back of the water droplet, but some of that light is transmitted and then has a secondary effect, but is reversed on a water droplet that's immediately behind the primary water droplet, all right? And that's where, that's where you can get a second faint reversed rainbow, okay? Yep, it's always dimmer. Yep, it's always dimmer, the color's always reversed, and it's caused by two internal reflections. Okay, but what is internal reflection, especially total internal reflection? Well, it occurs at a certain critical angle, okay? So one thing that we haven't talked about is the, act, is the actual law that's driving this refraction. And I wanna tell, I wanna just give it to you now, okay? So we have, so if we look here and we imagine the angle of, basically the angle of incidence, all right? So let's have, here. Okay, so this, this angle right here, this would be theta i, that's the angle of incidence, and then this would be theta r, which is the angle of refraction, okay? So in this case, our angle of incidence is smaller than our angle of refraction because we're going from water to air, and in doing so, we're going from a higher index of refraction to lower index of refraction, so we're bending away from the normal, and the normal is the red line that I drew, okay? And the actual law that drives that, called Snell's law, says that n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2, or to use the notation, ni for the material um, of incidence, sine theta i, the incident angle, equals the material that you're traveling into, the refractive material, so nr, and then sine theta r. And that's the angle, that's the formula you can use to always find what is going to be the new angle given maybe two known indices of refraction and an incident angle, okay? But it turns out that you can get a case where none of the, none of the actual rays, none of the light is traveling into the other, the other material. Because what happens is consider when you have, basically when, when this, this angle here becomes 90 degrees, right? What if, you're, what if your angle of refraction becomes 90 degrees? Well, look, here it has, right? So here's the normal direction. This is the refracted ray right here. What's that? Well, that's theta r, and it equals 90 degrees. Well, sine of 90 degrees is one, okay? And so that tells you then that then you have sine of theta incidence just is going to equal the, the, in, the angle here, or the index of refraction of the, that's being refracted into, in this case, air, and then divided by the, um, the, in, the, the indice of refraction for the material you started in, in this case water, so the incident material, and so then that's going to be your critical angle, because notice this other, the sine of theta r just disappeared from the equation, because again, sine of 90 degrees is just equal to 1, so it just goes away. And so then you can actually solve for the angle of incidence called the critical angle. So then theta crit is then just going to be sine inverse of nr over ni, okay? 
and that's and that's also tells us why you can only have total internal reflection when you're going from a higher index indice refraction to a lower indice refraction because if you take sine inverse of something that's greater than one your calculator is going to say error sine inverse only makes sense for values less than one so this ratio of nr over ni has to be less than one all right and that's only going to work if you have a material you started in with a higher index of refraction. So NR in this case being air would be one, and then NI, the index of refraction of water, is maybe 1.4. And so then you'd have a, a sine inverse of one over 1.4, and that would give you your angle. That would tell you that as long as you shined your flashlight at an angle that was equal to the critical angle or greater, okay, or greater, because then you could shine it, you could shine it so it's even steeper, like in this case over here. Right, so it's, hit, it's hitting, hitting the surface even more obliquely. But what's happening then is lo as long as it's at that angle or greater, measured, measured relative to the normal, then no light will pass into the air. Okay? All the light will then be trapped in the water. And so this has big consequences in terms of like what you see when you're in the water. So a fish, for example, when it looks up to the surface, it can't see anything over here, right? It is, its view of the sky is effectively restricted to this 96 degree arc because everything, everything outside of that arc is, well, it's not, it's, it can't see anything because of total internal reflection, okay? All right, also you couldn't see the fish if you were looking in at an angle that's steeper than that as well, okay? This also applies to trapping light inside of prisms Right in this case, um, having the light bounce around in the pair of binoculars, and it also applies to fiber optics. Right, that's the exact idea behind fiber optics. The light comes in at a steep, a steep angle relative to the normal, and then so the light then bounces along that fiber. That fiber can then take any path, but the light is trapped in that fiber. It's a wonderful process, right? Because then you can basically you know know that the light is going to fo follow that fiber optic. Right here it is, and you can see these the, the, all these are all would all be cases of total internal reflection. So total internal reflection is an interesting, interesting one because you got to remember it's reflection, but it's reflection that's driven by the law of refraction. Okay, so kind of separate that in your mind from the from this the law of reflection. Total internal reflection is a different phenomenon. It is actually a refractive phenomenon resulting in reflection. Okay, different than just true reflection. Okay, so last thing we'll mention here really briefly is uh, lenses. There are two common types of lenses. They're the same as the mirrors we mentioned, concave and convex. So a converging lens is a double convex lens. That's like this one right here because it bends out in both, on both sides, the left and the right. It's always thicker at the center. That's one way you can easily tell if you forget, forget the rules about convex and concave. All right, a diverging lens is concave. It's doubly concave. It curves in on both the left and the right, which means it's always thinner in the middle, all right? And the reason that they're called converging and diverging is the, con the, the, the double convex lens, the converging lens, well, it converges light. So as the light passes in, all the rays that were parallel to each other, as shown here in blue, all those rays are converged to a single point. So that's how you can use, use a lens to, fo to focus light to a single point. On the other hand, a diverging lens causes rays that were parallel to go off in every direction and never meet again. So it's the opposite of bringing them together. It's sending them off in separate directions, just spreading them out, okay? They have different uses. Sometimes they're used together. Um, one lens or another is used whether you're farsighted or nearsighted, okay? And so here are some of the key features of lenses in terms of the principal axis, the focal point, and the focal length, okay? All right, so lenses are, de are determined entirely by their focal length. That's the only thing you need to know for a lens is its focal length, okay? All right, so images are, um, are formed as a consequence of light traveling in straight lines. The first type of camera was a pinhole camera. Now they use lenses, obviously. All right, pinhole images are caused by small openings in the leaves. That's what we're seeing here in terms of the images of the sun. All right, a lens nicely bends the straight line path, right? So this is, this is the case of basically a magnifying glass. So we've placed a object, a flower in this case, within the focal length of a, of a converging lens. And when you do that, you create a virtual image that is larger than the object itself. That is what you do with a magnifying glass. Notice it's a virtual image because the eye can only see virtual images. So this is actually using a converging lens to create a virtual images, virtual image. Converging lenses, converging lenses can create both real and virtual images. On the other hand, diverging lenses, those double convex lenses we saw a couple slides back, they only create virtual images, okay? 
Here's a converging lens that is creating a real image, right? So you've seen both. Here's a conver converging lens creating the virtual image like a magnifying glass. Here's a converging lens being used for instead projecting something onto a wall, creating a real image. Notice real images are always inverted, okay? Whereas virtual images are always upright. That's an important difference between the two. Also, this one you couldn't see unless there was a wall there. Like if we took away the wall, there, you wouldn't know there was a real image there because the eye cannot perceive light when it focuses on a single point because it's focused on that point, right? How, how would you know that it's there if it's just focusing on a single point, right? Our eye, our eye can't like collect information from our surroundings. Our eye is only aware of the light that actually comes into the eye and is allowed to focus, not, not that of which is already focused, okay? So the action of lenses depends mainly on, all right, well, refraction. They're, 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 there's not reflection in lenses. They are a refractive um, tool, all right? As far as lens defects, they're not perfect because we're assuming, we're assuming basically this, this ideal I idea that they're, they're you know, truly focusing on a single point, but due to the fact that they have, you know, like they're not, you know, that they have various, various paths that the light is gonna take, in reality, they don't focus on a single point. That's called aberration, okay? Um, and also, remember that inevitably, whatever you make the lens out of, it's going to behave differently for different wavelengths. There's no perfect material that doesn't have some dispersion. And so that, that chromatic um, dispersion creates chromatic aberration. Okay? All right. So there we are with our idea about kind of the, the geometry of light, thinking a lot about rays. And importantly, you got to remember, this is all about reflection and refraction. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching this video.